So, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, this morning, you heard Ibrahim talking about MOF, Model Openness Framework, and MOT, Model Openness Tool. And um, he gave you a sneak preview. And this session, we're going to get into more deep de um, details about those uh, MOF and MOT. Okay, um, so today we have three speakers, and we are all from the generative, you know, LFAI and data and um, PyTorch Foundation. And I'm, my name's Annie Lai. I am currently chairing the Generative AI Commons. Um, um, and, um, and this effort, MOF and MOT, actually comes from Generative AI Commons uh, work. And we have um, uh, Kaylian from uh, Linux Foundation Research, and we have Matt. Um, he was working also on MOF, and um, recently he took a new position as the ED for PyTorch Foundation, but he's still very much involved in MOF. So, um, so very quickly, I just want to say, you know, Generative AI Commons was launched last December, and in a very short six months, we we're able to bootstrap this um, community. And um, so our goal is to democratize and accelerate the um, Generative AI and via open source, open tooling, open research, and open collaboration. And um, we are, um, it's an open membership, so you don't have to belong to any Linux Foundation member company. Um, anybody in the world can come and join. And we, I host um, bi-weekly meetings, and we have work streams. Each work stream also hosts bi-weekly meetings. So as you can see, it's very rigorous. And we pretty much covered a lot of areas um, under generative AI. And it is community driven. So whatever topic that you want to do research on or you, a project you want to work on, all you do is you raise them at the work stream and find people who are passionate about the same subject to collaborate with you. And we, respond, we embrace responsible and ethics uh, trustworthy AI and open communication uh, open collaboration we believe that openness and transparency are the cornerstone to build responsible AI and currently we are organized um, this way we have five work streams as you can see and we can never have enough people please come join us check out generative AI Commons website and like I said earlier, MOF and MOT came out of the Frameworks work stream. Okay, without further ado, I'm gonna like to introduce the next speaker, Kaylin, and he's gonna talk to you more details about MOF and MOT. Thank you, Annie. That was very, very efficient. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Kaylin Osborne. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, thank you for coming and well done for making it to, to this far into uh, the, the conference, I'm, I'm sure you're <laughs> um, tired, but um, I hope, I'm sure you've enjoyed the many sessions today. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, in, within 20 minutes, give you a very, very quick overview of the model openness framework, which Ibrahim um, also mentioned in his, in his keynote uh, this morning. Um, we're going to start with a quick show of hands. Um, and just to let you know, this, this QR code goes to the archive page. It's not a dodgy QR code. <laughs> um, but the first question is, Please raise your hand if you're familiar with the model openness framework. And familiarity here is defined as you've read it, you understand how the classification system works, and so on. OK, good, about six people. Second, you've heard about it. For example, you were at the keynote this morning, but you don't know any more about it. OK, great, most of you. And third, this is the first time you've heard about the model openness framework. OK, great, that makes my job a bit easier. Um, so let's start off with some background. So the million dollar question is, what is openness in AI? I have to apologize, I haven't come here with a definition, I've just come here with a list of problems. Um, if you're interested in following work to develop a definition, you should definitely check out what the Open Source Initiative is doing and participate in their working group. Um, but here's a list of some of the problems we're facing. So there's no consistent definition of openness in AI uh, or open source AI. Um, there's a rapidly growing number of models calling themselves open source, but there's a lot of open washing, a lot of uh, new or restrictive uh, you know, licenses being applied to these models uh, beyond weights. Often many components that are you know, used in the development of these models are not being shared. Um, there's uh, some illegally converted licenses. And of course, there's a big debate about the relative benefits and risks of openness in AI. 
So just moving on, um, here are just some examples of different kinds of licenses which are being applied to open models. On the left, uh, you'll, you'll see some familiar you know, OSI-approved uh, licenses like Apache 2. And on the right, you'll see some of the proprietary restrictive licenses which have been developed. Now, the problem is that, as you know, in broad strokes, you know, open, open OSS licenses cover software. But um, as we say, you know, discuss in the model openness framework, um, these open models have at least 17 components, which we categorize into code, data, and documentation, which all have their uh, respective open license requirements. So what is being done at the moment isn't really a, uh, an appropriate uh, way of, of licensing open models. And I'll get back, in, back to this later when I introduce the, the, the MOF. Um, so yeah, MOF in a nutshell. We have a bunch of problems. A lot of, you know, most AI systems that are open models that are shared are black boxes. There are a lot of problems for reproducibility, transparency, safety, ethics, usage. Um, you know, majority of open models are not enterprise ready because of these problems. Um, so what we do is we present a solution, which is the open model openness framework, as well as the tool which Matt was going to in, uh, introduce later. What it is, is a, a systematic methodology to evaluate the completeness and openness of, of models. And we have developed a, a three-tiered classification system with open license requirements for the 17 components that I mentioned on the previous slide. And in a nutshell, the added value of this is on the one hand for uh, model developers, so for researchers and developers, it offers guidance uh, to increase the openness of models. And also, on the other hand, the benefits for uh, model users, um, so in, uh, in particular enterprises, providing clarity about what is provided and what the licenses are. So one of the first things um, we, we, we did is we looked at all these uh, concepts of openness. And, uh, this is, uh, I'm not going to go into every concept in this fruit salad of open concepts here, because we don't have time, but in the paper we, we look at all these different concepts and we discuss you know, their, their history, uh, norms, practices, uh, licenses uh, used in these various fields. Um, and uh, just for brevity, I'll quickly just go over open science though. So as I'm sure you're familiar, it's an approach to scientific research that uh, emphasizes and promotes uh, transparency. And, um, so the, with the, goal, well, the goals of increasing transparency, enabling reproducibility, and facilitating advances in research, and it includes various practices, including open access to research publications, for example, on archive, to uh, access to open data, of course, open source software development, uh, open methodologies, peer review, and collaboration. Um, another important aspect of open science are the concepts of completeness and openness. So completeness refers to how comprehensive the you know, provision of the various components are, and openness being a binary property, defining you know, whether a particular com component is licensed with a appropriate open license. So um, I'll just move on in the interest of time. So yeah, we, we've kind of mapped out these 17 components um, with regards to deep learning models. Um, and as you can see, uh, in, the, in the first row, we have code component, components, uh, the second row, we have data components, and you'll notice here that we have model weights and parameters are here. Um, and so that's a major kind of difference or kind of novelty of what we're recommending in terms of appropriate open license usage is moving away from using open source software licenses um, for, for weights or you know, open models and using uh, data licenses. And then finally, uh, the documentation category. And... Um, we have a yeah, three-tiered classification system, as I mentioned. So the, the, I should say the third one, shown here is the first one, uh, includes model architecture, the, the final checkpoints, uh, technical report, evaluation results, model card, data card, and some sample outputs. Then uh, class two, I'm just going over this quickly, by the way, because I know Ibrahim mentioned it, and it's in the paper, which you can check out, and Matt is going to go over it later. Um, but so I'm sorry for going over it so quickly. But yeah, class two involves open tooling. Uh, so it involves all of the class three components, as well as optionally supporting libraries and tools, evaluation data, evaluation code, inference code, and training code. 
And then the ultimate tier is open science. Um, very few models uh, are meeting this, this tier. Um, but this inv uh, includes all class two components plus uh, model metadata parameters at the intermediate checkpoints, data pre-processing assessing code, data sets. We've received a lot of community feedback that this is impossible. So we've modified this to say that you know any license or unlicensed could be acceptable and a research paper. Um, and then we also give recommendations for various licenses. Um, here is just a snapshot of you know preferred and acceptable, but when you check out the model openness tool, you'll see you know drop down menus for many other licenses. And Matt, I believe you you'll, will you show the, the... Yeah. okay great. So I'm I'm yeah in the interest of time, I'm not going to read them out. Um, but that's the kind of you get the gist of how the model openness framework works and what we're trying to achieve with it. And so. Of course, we want it to be implemented and used and impactful. Um, so for when you're, if you're a developer and you're preparing distribution, um, we encourage you to include license files that describe the licenses used for all the various components. And, and when you use the model openness tool um, to produce a MOF JSON file to describe the, the MOF class, um, including all the components and licenses used. And uh, it will give you a class assignment, and it will look a bit like this. Um, and you'll get a badge as well. Uh, but yeah, Matt will discuss that in more detail. Now, to finally, just go over some ma you know, major benefits and limitations of the MOF. So there's some benefits for model producers. Um, you know, it provides you know, a systematic, systematic methodology and guidance for developers to know, okay, how can they increase the models? What are the various components that they can or, or should share to reach a certain tier of openness? Um, enables reproducibility of and collaboration on models. Um, you know, in, in, in this kind of collaboration can inc uh, improve the performance and security of models through uh, feedback and, and you know, inputs from the community. You can also build a vibrant ecosystem around your models. And also, it's a way to comply with regulations like the AI Act by increasing transparency. Uh, for consumers, there are also um, benefits, you know, providing clarity about you know, the extent to which uh, a model is open and, you know, the license is used for all the various components, uh, enabling enterprises to build products and services on these models, um, enhance models for their own purposes, collaborate with, you know, broader communities and ecosystems around those models. Um, so, yeah, those are the kind of the main benefits. Of course, there are some limitations which we want to be honest about. Uh, the first is that it's tailored to deep learning models, you know, expanding it to other types of uh, AI models is, is not hard, but in its current format, it's limited to that. Um, the second one is the you know elephant in the room, data sets. Um, I mean, other components, but data sets in particular, it's going to be really hard to get um, you know, model developers uh, to, to share those. Because um, there are a lot of other considerations that have to be balanced, including privacy, data protection, copyright, and intellectual property considerations. Um, third, classifying models according to our system may not fully capture their functionality, and the MOF doesn't address concerns about bias and, and, and safety. Although the hope is that by increasing transparency, there can be more you know, crowdsourced auditing and improvements of the models. And finally, you know, it, it, it might be seen as too simple and overlook uh, important nuances, but you know, continuous improvement with community uh, input is the name of the game. So if you have ideas for improving it, please get involved. Um, so yeah, call to action. Uh, you can check out um, the model openness tool at isitopen.ai, and if you scan this QR code, you can find out how you can uh, participate in the generative AI uh, commons community and contribute to the development of the model openness framework and tool. I'll just give you a second to, to take a picture of that. And on that note, I'll invite Matt uh, to come up to give a demo of the 20 minutes. Great. Oh, and yeah, so if you have any, one way to get involved is by reading the paper if you haven't read it yet, and then, um, yeah, sharing comments about how it can be improved. Great. On that note, I'll introduce Matt. All right, 
Good day, folks. Um, I have the privilege of using the next 15 minutes to do about a three minute demo. So we're going to take it real slow today. <laughs> um, if you don't, <laughs> right. Uh, so for those that you don't know me, I'm Matt White. I'm the executive director at the PyTorch Foundation and the GM of AI at the Linux Foundation. Um, so we, we've got this model openness framework. We looked at how we could make it more actionable, right? As opposed to being just a, uh, a published paper. And we came up with sort of like a weekend uh, program here to write some code and try to make something that's a little bit viable uh, and, and fairly intuitive and lightweight. So we came up with this model openness tool concept. Um, I'll show a few slides here and then, does this have internet by the way? Okay. Um, and then I'll go through a, a demo. So we have this model listing page. This is our default page. It just lists out all the models. Uh, it lists the name, the organization that developed it. And then most importantly, the classification of it. Um, and so we have class one, class two, and class three, right? And, and so class three is our entry level. That's the open model. We have class two, which is sort of like this intermediate stage between um, open science and, and open models. And then we have open science, which is like the cat's pajamas, right? That's your, your data sets and all the data preprocessing code as well. And then we have badges. So part of this process is to be able to take badges that are produced here. They're, they're intuitive, so you, you know where the qualification is and whether something is still in progress or whether it's, um, you know, there's a fail or, or fail condition. The next part of this is that these badges are uh, exported, exportable, and so you can drop them into your GitHub repo and people intuitively know uh, where you rank in the model openness framework. Um, and this is a screenshot of the uh, model evaluation. Um, basically, you just enter the details about your model, and then you kind of go through all these components uh, to evaluate how you rank your particular model. And I think I'll just go live with this, um, since we do have a little bit of time. Well, we're troubleshooting our hardware problem. Um, yeah, Jim wanted me to make this announcement. Under LFAI and data, there's a community ca calendar. So that's where you can see all the events and then participate in various work stream meetings. So, um, and that is live. It works right now. <laughs> okay, do you want Q&A? I mean, while we are waiting for that, we can have some Q&A. Okay, um, question. Um, is it working now? Uh, or to take one question. Yeah, I have one question on uh, OSI. You mentioned them a couple of times for the licenses. They are also coming up with this uh, open, AI, uh, open AI system framework. How does what they do relate to what you do? And is it not possible to come up with one definition? It seems like we're heading to two now in the open source community. And what's your take on that? Definition, open AI, the OSI, you're talking about OSI, right, right, right. You want to, do you want to tackle that? Yeah. I'll try my best. Thank you for your question. So what OSI is doing is um, they're trying to develop the definition for open source AI. We're not trying to create a definition. Um, what we're trying to do is, um, you know, create kind of a methodology for opening up models. The, the overlap is that in their process of defining open source AI, they're inviting um, contributors, including myself, to um, rate the openness of models according to our 17 components. So they're, they're using the framework as kind of to structure their approach right now. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's actually complementary. We're actually working very closely with OSI team. You know, a bunch of us go to their meetings. So we came up with the 16 or 17 components. And then um, they take the 17 components and they pick and choose and then, you know, define the 
AI, um, open source AI based on the components that we uh, define here. So it's highly complementary, yeah. Hello, hi. I'm Arno Luas from IBM, co-chair of Gen AI Commons. So, I mean, there is also a big difference, which is here, as you saw, there is a ranking with different categories. While the OSI definition aims to be a Boolean, it's either open or not. So that makes a big difference. Oh, it's up. Oh, okay. I'll give you a mic back. All right, we got like three minutes. <laughs> it worked out perfectly. <laughs> All right, so this is our landing page. Uh, please enjoy the disclaimer. We uh, give no guarantees here. This is beta software. So, um, so effectively, we have a list of all the models, as I kind of covered. You can search for models. You can uh, put the model name in, the organization. And so let's take a, you know, we take a look at Rock of V5 here and we drill down and we get more detail, right? So we get, we know the mod, whether it's, you know, it is a class three. Uh, the conditional pass has to do with the fact that a lot of organizations are using open source software licenses to address model um, licensing or data licensing, sorry, the model parameter licensing rather. Um, and so, but a, a pass is good. Um, you know, they're kind of failing on the tooling side in open science. They don't really have um, all the components there, but they've, they've got some of them. Um, we identify whether something is issued with an invalid license or not. Uh, and so we kind of, you know, calculate this and, and um, generate a badge from it. So we also include the GitHub repo and Hugging Face links. And for those that actually own the model, uh, you can download the JSON file and drop that into your, your GitHub repo um, to be in compliance. And so there's just a, nat a nice status message here that says a conditional pass because it's using an open source license for final um, model parameters. Uh, you can copy out your badge here and drop this into your readme.markdown file. And the reporting function is super important because there are going to be some inaccuracies in this data. And so if you see something that looks wrong, uh, please report it so that we can actually rectify that issue. So if you come to the site, you can actually um, evaluate models, uh, evaluate your own model, or evaluate some third-party model that's not listed here. You will select the types of licenses that you're using. So, you know, there's, you know, Apache, like, kind of go through here and just you know pick out the licenses and then you can evaluate it and uh, figure out how your model ranks um, based on the particular licensing that you've chosen uh, let me see here let's do community data license too and so this is like the bare minimum you're gonna you got model architecture mark model parameters so look you need your model card data card and your technical report as well as some evaluation results in order to meet the class three definition. And then the last function piece of functionality here is the submitting your model. So um, when you log into, if you're not just using it to gather information and you're actually logging in because you want to submit a model, you're going to be logging in with your GitHub account and that GitHub account needs to have access to the repo wherever your model is, is located. Um, We've got this nice little button here to set preferred licenses. So this will set all the default licenses to the preferred ones that were um, mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, you would select your repo and fill out some details. So in some cases, that detail will be filled out for you. Um, but you'll go through here and fill out your model details, uh, the architecture, whether it's you know fine-tuned model, it's pre-trained, so forth, and then go through here and you'll see that all the default licenses are selected but you can certainly uh, apply different licenses and then yeah and, and so we're still I, I will say that this is like very beta and we although it's very functional we're looking at whether we need to make improvements to this so that it works uh, a little more seamlessly for folks 
Um, and so we're very open to suggestions on how we can sort of improve this and, and make it a little bit easier to work with. But, um, you know, going with a preferred set of licenses, there's certainly no problem with that. They're all very permissive licenses and uh, contain no downstream restrictions. And so um, we're hopeful that this will uh, continue to grow. And we are looking for folks that love to uh, do internet research. Um, and find out what licenses are being used by all these components because we have, we know that there are around 4,000 models submitted to Hugging Face on a daily basis. Uh, we have like 200 plus and we're still, um, you know, hacking away and trying to get data in there. So if anyone's interested, uh, you know, please reach out to us and um, we'd love to have you help us kind of fill this out. But uh, we do feel like we have, a, you know, a fair bit of information here to get, get us started and, uh, you know, continue through this uh, this process of getting this up and going. And with that said, I'm I went six minutes. <laughs>